Happy May Day to all out there. Hopefully you are celebrating the Happy May Day out there. Hopefully you are celebrating May Day with some lovely flowers or enjoying the spring blooms outside. May Day was a special day in my house and tradition as growing up, my mom would make me and my sister run and deliver uh, baskets of flowers to all of her friends. We'd have to run them up and drop them on their doorstep and ring and hide around, run around the corner where mom was waiting in our getaway car. It was kind of risky behavior for uh, mom, so I thought it was pretty fun that she was so scandalous in leaving lovely flowers for everybody on that day. But hopefully you get some lovely flowers to enjoy in your gardens, uh, springing up with this lovely rain we've had. We are looking at inside the text for um, this coming Sunday, May 5th. Sorry, this is my second edition of this. I actually was live at 1.30 and um, it didn't record. So I should be well versed. But we're looking at um, Sunday, May 5th is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and we are uh, still in John 15, the parable of the vine and the branches, which is a takeoff, um, a second week of that. So we're going to add the Acts text today. You get a twofer, two for the price of one, as we look at John 15, 9 through 17, the second part of I am the vine and you are the branches analogy. And then we also jump into Acts 8, uh, which is the... Um, implementation of the gospel in the real world. So, I invite you to open up your Bibles and follow along for John 15, starting in verse 9. Jesus is talking to his disciples. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you keep do what I command. If you do not call, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the father or the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appoint you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in his name. And I am giving you these commands so that you might love one another. So John's uh, gospel in the sixth week is... Um, an expansion of what Jesus was meaning in this vine and the branches. You know, in John, anytime he's got a good uh, analogy, he just beats it to death and uses it week after week. That's why he you know, does extensions of I am the good shepherd. You know, with I am the bread of life, he, you know, in August we'll have six weeks of I am the bread of life, or four weeks of it. Um, so as a pastor, you're always stretching the what else can I say about this? But what John is trying to do is he's trying to go a deeper level than where he was before. Every single time he uses the analogy. Like when he said, I am the bread of life, one week, and then he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven the next week, or I am the bread of life the, of eternal food. He's going a little, expanding the depth of that. So here we have I, um, where Jesus, again saying, I am the vine and you are the branches, He's saying, he's asking not only abide in me, but abide in my love. So what does that mean, abide in his love? It's um, kind of like the Apostle Paul would say, putting on the mind of Christ. It's saying, okay, if, if you are abiding in me, this is what it will look like if you abide in my love. Uh, so love has become the hallmark of what it then looks like to be a disciple. Jesus tried to show this to his disciples um, by you know, washing their feet, saying, this is what love looks like, that you would serve one another uh, as I have served, served you. And so his community of uh, disciples are called to works of love and justice um, and loving the world that God loved. Not just loving God, but loving the world that God loved. Um, and it looks like laying down one's life for your friends. So, if you want to look at the completion or the fulfillment of that, where do we go? But we go to 
um, the book of Acts in the 8th chapter. And this is a um, well-known verse uh, in the book of Acts about the, the outsider being included and becoming a friend and insider. So I invite you to open up your Bible, uh, turn to page uh, the 8th chapter of Acts, the 26th verse through 40. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, so here we have angels talking to the disciples, encouraging them in the role of the mission of the church. The angel said, get up and go toward the south to, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Important that Gaza is included in the narrative of, of the pathway of where believers were coming and going from. This was the wilderness road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit of, uh, said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join in. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading from Isaiah was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent at the shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. So the eunuch asked, asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And then Philip began to speak, starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is some water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When he came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Astos, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So, Acts is a great scripture to use um, in um, the Easter season. It urges us to put um, the rational fear of you know, all those uh, expectations and boundaries aside, because Easter, you know, if we're looking at a resurrected Lord, you know, if God could do that, what else could God do? And so Acts you know, looks into the fulfillment of how the Holy Spirit let loose in the world will change all sorts of expectations. Um, the encounter on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza is simply an expansion of that, um, with Philip speaking to the Ethiopian, and provides you know question for all of this. If if this gospel is for all the world and all the people, where could there be an exception or it limited? So it's understanding that um, Acts you know one dictated that uh, Jesus told his followers. You will be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, and then throughout all the world, to the ends of the earth. So Acts 1 through 8 is the story of his disciples being witnesses around Jerusalem, around Judea, to all sorts of different people. And now in Acts 8, 26, we have the ends of the earth. And that's dictated by uh, Philip going in, uh, the Holy Spirit leading Philip to talk to this Ethiopian. So, why an Ethiopian? Well, the queen, uh, t the queen who he served, her title, Candace, uh, would have been from the southern kingdom of Egypt. You know, there were times, if anybody knows Egyptian history, when the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, you know, who reigned, um, and Ethiopia and the region um, around the, the headwaters of the Nile, where Ethiopia, Ethiopia is, uh, was a very powerful kingdom. And because all trade for Africa, I mean, up and down the Nile, 
into sub-Saharan Africa came through that region. So there was great wealth uh, in the Ethiopian kingdom. To the, however, to the Greco-Roman world, the word Ethiopia was considered the ends of their empire and the boundary of the sub-Saharan empire. It wasn't part of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire was around the Mediterranean, you can remember, and, and Europe and Turkey, but stopped at the end of the Nile. They didn't go farther than that. So here was the end to the ends of the earth, depicted by this Ethiopian. Now he's also depicted as a eunuch. So if you know anything about court culture in those days, um, eunuchs, uh, servants of the court were often castrated so that they the fidelity of the queen or the um, king's uh, family was uh, protected. So it could have been by service, it could have been by choice, it could have been by violence, it could have been by his birth. It doesn't say, but it would have elicited uh, condensation and derision of someone being less than others or less than. So the eunuch didn't fit any conventional. Um, notations of gender in the Roman world that this scripture is read and written for. Interestingly enough, you know, gender was uh, an issue for people to understand how did these people fit, where's their value and their worth in that culture as it continues to, you know, unfortunately still be a uh, troublesome um, misnomer for people today. In that day and age, it often meant that the individual is powerless. However, this individual was the head of the Queen's Treasury. The head of the Queen's Treasury had all the power because they directed where money went and didn't go, who got funding and who didn't get funding. Um, and Acts describes this person as not only powerful, but he's literate and wealthy, um, enough to have a scroll of Isaiah um, and the use of a chariot to come and go as he needed. Um, which was unheard of in that day and age. So a foreigner, yet extremely powerful, yet an outsider, um, a very complex individual. So the question is, he came to Jerusalem. Was he Jewish or was he, um, was he a Gentile? Understand that there were Jewish communities all over the region. Um, and it's, it's clear that this individual likely was Jewish. If you remember when Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had to flee Herod uh, because Herod had even promised to kill every child under the age of three in the region. So they escaped to where? They escaped to Ethiopia. And there were Jewish communities there that protected them until they could return at a later date. So he was likely uh, Jewish and from a Jewish community who came, traveled to Jerusalem. Well, how was he received in Jerusalem if he was an outsider, a eunuch, um, and a wealthy person? Deuteronomy would have said, as a eunuch, he's not allowed in the temple, that he couldn't, he couldn't go there, and it would have been forbidden. However, he did come to worship. So it doesn't say we don't know where, but he traveled there um, and was received well enough that he had a scroll and worshiped and was in that region. The other thing that is interesting is the he has no hesitation to go into Jerusalem to worship, to engage in this pra faith practice that uh, he's invested great resources to get there. Imagine the journey in that day and age from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Um, and so he confounds any expected boundaries and goes to receive this good news uh, uh, or connect with the God that he believes. Um, and he, that he's knowledgeable about. It reminds us that, especially in Easter season, the good news travels to the ends of the earth primarily not by conventional programs or by a planned initiative, but by the gospel getting loose, uh, by people hearing about it and engaging, going, that includes me. So this individual carries it, and it also recognizes that the good news um, that he identifies himself as worthy and full of dignity by what the good news proclaims. Um, and it thought it, you know, the good news crosses boundaries of prejudice and religious, um, you know, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. 
because it's Jesus' message to all people. It's not messages of who's in or out, but who who um, who is loved by God, universal. Also important to recognize in this is that as they're traveling along, as um, he's read Isaiah, so now Philip tells him about Jesus and how Jesus is the fulfillment of the word of God come down um, and came to save the world and love all people. Instantly, this um, Ethiopian says, well, if he you know, proclaimed a baptism of repentance through him, here's some water, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip, Philip did into, ask, hey, do you want to be baptized? The Ethiopian went, that should have include me, so shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip's like, all right, let's baptize you. And um, instantly, he's baptized into what Philip proclaims to him is the love of God, the love of Jesus. And there's the fulfillment of what does it mean to abide in my love is the proclamation that this is for you. So the Ethiopian is the first actual, you know, constructive theologian upon the gospel, meaning applying the gospel to his unique context that no one else would have applied it to, but he's interpreted it and going, this means me, which is the essence of what the vine and the branches is. Abide in me, abide in my love, as I have abided in you. Go and bear much fruit. Um, that is worthy of the gospel. So we pray that you will join with us on Sunday and be with us, and also that you will enjoy the love and the beauty of um, some spring flowers in your life. And my wish to you, happy May Day. Too bad I can't ring and run your doorbells, but know that I hope the bounty and the beauty of God's creation upon you all. Take care.